Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. For today's episode, and today we have with us Jamie Price, and she is with Stop, Breathe, Think, and they have an app and a social media outlets, and they're focusing on meditation to help guide us find our inner peace and. Since this is a podcast for guiding us to finding that inner peace, I wanted to uh, speak with uh, Jamie just to help to better understand where they're coming from and what they can do to help guide us in finding our inner peace. So welcome, Jamie. Thank you for being with us. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Uh, It's a pleasure. Uh, Can you... uh, Tell a bit about yourself and the uh, Stop, Breathe, Think movement. Sure. Um, I actually have a background in law and investment banking. And when I was working for Smith Smith Barney, which is an investment bank in New York City, I just really felt like I wanted a lot more meaning in my life and to do something that had a much more positive impact, not only on myself, but other people. And so around that time when I was really searching and trying to figure out what it is I wanted to do, I happened to meet a Tibetan Buddhist lama, a meditation teacher. Okay. He started teaching me, he started teaching me how to meditate. And I was so um, impressed with how profound of an impact this simple technique of meditation was having in my own life that I wanted to pursue that further. And it was also around that time that there was a lot of um, gang violence in the areas where the, my teacher lived. And he felt like if we could teach these kids on a widespread basis how to meditate, um, we could really have a transformative impact on their lives. And so he asked me if I would help them figure out how to translate and communicate about these techniques of meditation and mindfulness in a way uh, that these kids could relate to and understand. And so I left my job and we created a nonprofit called Tools for Peace. And so I've been teaching a mindfulness to uh, at-risk youth in, in schools and after-school programs since 2000. And the mm. Thought Reason Think, Think app really came out of that work. We were seeing so much success with the kids we were working with, we wanted to find a way to reach more and what better way to do that than with an app because kids are so often on their devices all the time. Right. Um, And that's how, that's how Stop, Reason, Think was born. That that's really awesome that you go from, you know, the, the type of work that you were doing, give it all up to do this nonprofit. And that that must've been a, a leap of faith right there. It was a huge shift. And definitely a leap of faith. But what I recognized as I looked around um, in the in the office, basically, with everyone I was working with, and then how I was feeling, I, I just didn't see very much contentment or happiness or peace of mind. And I thought there just has to be a, a better way to live life than this. Right. So really taking this leap into saying, you know, hey, we're going to work with these youth who are getting in, into gangs and the violence and, and all, all that. How do you even break into that? You know, that, that seems, I mean, a wonderful goal. And, and I think everybody would agree, hey, that, that'd be awesome. 
But how do you break into, yeah. you know, like gang activity to say, hey, you know, guys, maybe if you just sit and meditate, life will be great. Yeah, we there were um, other students of my meditation teacher who had been working with incarcerated youth. And so mm -hmm. we started there. And mm. it naturally it naturally evolves because really when you work with with teens, whether they're incarcerated youth or considered at risk or inner city, they're all the same. Um, they're like sponges. They just want some attention and instruction. They're ready to learn. And so it was pretty actually easy transition from working with kids in, in incarcerated and going just into schools like regular after school or in school programs. The way we taught it was basically the same, although some of the language was slightly different. But that's really interesting that, that they were receptive to that because it, it does seem to me, and, and uh, I know people have talked about that, the people who get into the gangs are doing that because they want to find community or family or you know mm -hmm. just a place to belong. So... I can see how bringing in in this program would work, but how do you sell to them, you know, something that seems to be not as exciting, at least on the outside, uh, you know, to say here, try this instead of what you're doing. It's a really good question. And you're right. It's not as easy as it, it, it may sound. Like I said, the, the two people we were working with had a lot of experience working with this population of students. So they already had a framework of trust built among them. Mm -hmm. But to, to be honest with you, uh, your modeling and your presence, how you're being with these kids, if you have a real sense of being in it together, working on this together, and giving them a little trust and credit themselves, I, I have found you get a lot of positive response from that, if that mm. makes sense. It, it makes perfect sense. And it, it really does go in, in with that piece of belonging. And I think it, it's awesome, you know, to bring something like this because I, I totally agree with that premise. Um, it, it just seemed such a, such a huge, you know, uh, undertaking and and yet it's working and been working for almost uh, two decades now yeah it really has I, I think you know we're all humans I think the biggest challenge is to overcome our sense of always needing to be in a rush or that fear of missing out or all this other stuff we're supposed to be doing and that's the same um, for all of us whether you're a teen or an adult and I think one of the things that we try to do with Stop, Read, and Think is to really promote that space to take some time out and be still and stop rushing. And I think when you do that, you're much more able to create a sense of peace and access, you know, that more peace of mind that I think a lot of people are looking for. Definitely. And, and that's what I find in my work is, you know, people are, are really longing to find that sense of peace, but I, I think are confused in how to do that. So, you know, something like bringing out this app is probably very beneficial, you know, to, to help a number of people. Can you talk a bit about the app as, as to what it does and its availability? Sure. We designed the app to make it really easy to get started with meditation and mindfulness practice, especially for people with no experience with it whatsoever. And so we started with a check-in process. So the app prompts you to just take a pause and it asks you how you're doing mentally and physically and you're able to also choose emotions, how you're feeling. And then based on what you input, we'll recommend meditations for you to try. And so it's a really easy funnel to get people to start meditating. And I think that's often the biggest barrier is just getting started because we find that once someone has actually tried it, they really like it and want to continue. So this isn't just a meditation app. This is really tailored to the individual. Yes, definitely. We thought that was really important. I think when I've talked to a lot of people about the barriers to getting started with meditation, it, it, it's 
it's about choice overload and not really sure what to do um, or what might work for them. And so tailoring it to that individual experience of what they're going through emotionally and physically, we thought was a great direction to take. Yeah, because it really seems to me that if you if there's just one meditation out there and, and everyone says, here, go do this and you're going to feel better. If it doesn't seem to resonate with me, I'm, I'm just apt not to try it again. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that, there's all sorts of, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, no. Continue. Well, there's all, there's all sorts of different techniques and methods and way of approaching mindfulness practice. Some people have a really easy time connecting with their breath, but others really don't. And it's more effective for them to engage in mindfulness through their senses, for example. Um, so you really have to, to make those different avenues available so people can, can connect with what resonates with them. So what I'm hearing in all this is that you're saying meditation can be very subjective and that if we can at least get the principles down, do it however it fits for you as an individual. Yeah, I think the key is to just get started. And I think everyone needs to start where they are. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, um, and just make it work for themselves in their own personal lives. Because meditation is very personal. It's not one size fits all or just this one right way to do it. And I also think, you know, in my mindfulness practice, I find I get the most benefits, not just on the cushion, but when I'm carrying that thread of mindfulness throughout my daily experience and bringing that kind of presence and attentiveness to my everyday activities, whether it be driving or washing dishes or even walking. And so I love the idea of making this whole variety of ways of engaging with mindfulness available to people. So it becomes less of kind of a chore and can potentially be something that's very um, fun and pleasurable to integrate into daily life. I totally agree. You know, if it's something that resonates with me and it's something that is you know where, where I can see it as applicable to my everyday life then yeah I'm, I'm gonna do it because I, I can see the benefit feel the benefit and it fits me when you know we we can get people say to start meditating and and I would agree with you I think the biggest hurdle is just get them to do it what are you finding is that next biggest hurdle what what's stopping people who agree with all of this and say, yeah, I'm going to do it. And they start it, but they don't keep going with it. What, what do you think is the biggest hurdle that we need to overcome to continue the practice? Well, I notice it's two things. One, people say it is making time to practice. Um, it becomes another thing that adds to their stress because they're feeling pressure to try to fit it in into a really busy day. Um, so there's that, but I also find that people tend to be uncomfortable with things that they don't feel good at or comfortable with right away. So you have to be okay with not being an ex expert meditator day one. Mm -hmm. And also to the, to the extent that you, you're trying to see a result or trying to achieve a result, it, it's counterintuitive because when you're meditating, you actually need to let that go and just allow the experience to be what it is. And sometimes it feels great. It can go really smoothly and you have a really nice experience. Other times it can be completely uncomfortable, physically and, and mentally, and it's actually all the same and you have to learn how to go with it no matter what. And I think that's a big obstacle too. It seems that we're, as a society, very, um, evidence oriented, very, and, and I mean, goal oriented, I think is good, but it, it's that, you know, what am I producing? What, what am I physically can show people for the time? So right. that seems to be that, that barrier, you know, 
yeah, how do I make time for something that I can't really tangibly show you that I accomplished over the time that I took to do this? Exactly. And I, I think you probably can, you know, find some of that evidence over time. But if you're looking at it on a moment by moment or, or each day basis, it, it's hard to find because it's like sometimes it's three steps forward, five steps back. Um, and you just have to be okay with that. And be very countercultural that things aren't going to happen overnight. You know, I mean, exactly. people go to, to, you know, fast food restaurants and still say it's too slow. You know, we're, we're so geared for that, you know, instantaneous gratification that really the meditation is an over time, you know, accumulation of, of what you're going to see change. But you're right. It's probably not going to be, you know, meditate once and, you know, your life is totally different. Exactly. I think we, we do hear from people that they do feel really good after the first time, you know, you can really feel a, a calming effect or a relief from a sense of anxiety, but most likely that initial hit of positive feeling doesn't happen every time. So you have to be able to keep working through it. Right. Exactly. Um, how have you seen this program grow, you know, where you're working with uh, the, the uh, students and, and with the gang members? Has this spread outside of your initial area? Uh, you know, oh, yeah. um, where, where is it now? Well, so we launched the app in January of 2014. My expectation was very small. We just, we just created it as a support for the students we were working with. But what was amazing to me is that it attained this incredible grassroots momentum and growth strictly by word of mouth. And so it's found a much bigger audience. I think we're at over 3 million installs of our app and over half our audience is now between the ages of 18 to 34. And Whoa. we have a lot of people who are even older than that using our app. So I think the fact that we made it just really simple and friendly and direct is really appealing to people. Um, I also think the spirit behind it really translates into the experience of using the app. It was created like from a place of generosity and like a gift to people. We weren't, we weren't intending to try to make money. We were just intending to share these incredible meditations that could genuinely change your life if you practice them and so I think that comes through and people like it so you're making something that's easy to use speaks to the individual and gives them a benefit exactly I mean how could you go wrong <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, so where is the uh Tools for Peace, is, is there, you know, like a, a program that can be replicated, you know, people who are listening, you know, say, hey, I'd, I'd love this in, you know, my school or my city or, you know, is this a replicable program? Currently, the program is focused in Northern and Southern California, and it's being implemented by people that we train. And so there are opportunities for ongoing training and support for implementation in other areas, but we don't have a huge infrastructure to support that. Okay, because I, you know, I, I'm fascinated by this. I really think that this is something that, that's very positive. And, you know, I, I can see other people, you know, looking at this and saying, whoa, if it's, you know, working and look at how many young people are downloading this app, you know, uh, might want to try it. Oh, right, so the app, you know, since the nonprofit, I should say, because it grew so um, extensively, I couldn't actually sustain the app within the context of the nonprofit anymore. So the app was spun out into its own separate entity and has been growing as a business on its own. And I think the mm -hmm. app itself is, is actually quite user friendly for anyone to take and use as a support to their work in 
in schools or with therapy clients, we hear from a ton of therapists and coaches, for example, who use our app in their work. And so, you know, we do provide a, a little bit of support for that kind of um, engagement, and we're looking to expand that level of support for using our app in that context. Yeah, that that's awesome, because when you've got people in, in that age category, category, you know, downloading and, and using this app, I, that can't do anything but make a world of difference within their lives and then the lives of the people around them. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. where, you know, where, where do you see um, this whole project going into the future? What, what's kind of the your like next steps or, or kind of the vision of, of what you would love to see this do next? I think the app is really evolving into a, an emotional wellness app. And as we discussed before, people kind of resonate with different paths to wellness. And so if Stop, Breathe, and Think is going to be an integral part of people's everyday emotional wellness, I think what we'd like to do is expand what we offer as techniques to support that. So we did add yoga. We have started um, testing out acupressure videos, and we might add some aromatherapy, for example, so that people really have a, a variety of things that they can integrate into their daily life to support their emotional wellness. But I, I do think we would like to be your go-to tool to support your everyday emotional wellness. Awesome. That that would be great to have one place and it sits on the phone, which is always with people and right, exactly. you know, there at any moment in the day, you can work on your wellness. Exactly. And that people that, that, really understand. Yeah. People really understand it's okay to take time to, to take care of that. It's actually really important. And it'll enrich every other aspect of your life. Without self care, we're we're all gonna, you know, fall apart and, and not be able to do what what it is that we need to do. So I, I totally uh, agree with that. That you know, self care is is important, but yeah, we seem to put it on the back burner. Uh, at least most of us do. And you know, having something like this app that you know that sits there front and center, uh, you know, really can keep that. In, in our minds that this is something that is important to do. I think another thing the app does really nicely is keep track of what you do in the app. So you can see over time um, the top emotion words you've chosen, the meditations you've done, how many, how many minutes you've spent actually meditating and practicing mindfulness. And I think that provides a lot of encouragement too. You can also earn stickers, which it's funny because people love stickers and mm. I think those kind of re rewards and encouragement for continuing um, are also really helpful. No, that that's awesome. And, and yeah, people are using stickers all over the place and in uh, social media and all. So that's, that's great to, you know, have something to, you know, aim for and, and some goal that you can then share with others. Right. What, what would you say for, you know, the person who is listening, who, you know, says, like, all right, I get it. I want to start meditating. What, what do you think their, their first couple steps should be if they really want to, you know, make this change in their life and they've never done this before? I think finding an app that works for you makes it really easy to get started um, because you can listen to a guided track. It helps you not feel lost or wonder if you're doing it right or you're doing the right thing. So I would start with an app, listen to a few guided meditations. Um, and then once you get the hang of it, you know, for example, listen to a basic mindful breathing track and try that for a few times. Um, once you get the hang of that and comfortable with a basic technique like mindful breathing, then there's a, a bunch of other ways you can support integration of doing it into your into your daily life like putting it on your calendar in advance setting the amount of time you want to do it for and and just doing it for that and starting simple i think 
people, if you're like me, I tend to jump in and try to do like, you know, an hour of meditation, my very first go. And mm -hmm. I think consist consistency is better than jumping in for some long period of time and then not doing it again for days or weeks. I think just start small and do it consistently and you'll see results over time. That, that sounds like a, a great plan and very mindful in and of uh, the plan, you know, start small, look for, mm -hmm. you know, the changes and keep going small and eventually it's going to be big. Exactly. Is there anything that you would like to share that we haven't covered or talked about? Well, I do think it's important to remember that you really don't want to make meditation or mindfulness practice another thing that you stress out about. It, it really helps to approach it with an attitude of kind of friendliness and it's something to enjoy. The fact that you can take a few minutes to just be still and quiet with yourself mm -hmm. can be really it can be really enjoyable and rewarding and so allow yourself to feel that and try not to make it another thing to achieve that you feel stressed about that that's wonderful advice you know and because then you're going to stop doing it and then have even more stress in your life so uh, <laughs> definitely exactly. uh, very good advice um, it, it's kind of that whole thing thing of, of being comfortable, um, you know, with yourself and be easy on yourself, you know, that do yeah. the best you can with it. Exactly. Excellent. So how can uh, people get in touch with you or, you know, find the app and get more information? You can find the app on the app store, stop, breathe and think. You can also go to our website, which has links to, um, you know, my email, and also the app on the Android store. And our, our website is stopbreathink.com. And then that should have all of the information there. Okay, excellent. And for those listening, I'll have that uh, link in the show summary uh, when it's posted so that you can just click over. And I highly encourage everyone to, to take a look at you know, that app and, and to really download that and work with it because for finding inner peace, slowing down and meditating, I, I do see is, you know, vital to that whole notion of finding that peace. And this really is a, a great tool. And as you say, an easy tool to be able to jump into it and, you know, start working on some of those techniques that'll be uh, very helpful well, for like to, uh, everybody and find Jamie that for being with us and for sharing you know, this wonderful project and, you know, all of your insights into how we can find our inner peace. And again, I encourage everyone to take a look at the website, download the app. Um, but really, thank you for uh, taking the time out of your schedule to share with us. Thank you so much, Chris. It was so nice to talk to you. The same. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode, and I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening. And have a very mindful day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.